look at this and tell me what it means. If you don't know programming, it's not at all intuitive. Now, what if you're watching a tutorial and the guy tells you to copy this into your script and you're just sitting there totally confused and he just tells you those classic words you hear in every tutorial. Don't worry about what this means for now. So in this video, to help you truly understand programming, you're going to learn all of the basic foundations so that you're not totally lost when following tutorials and so that you don't even need to follow them. Because the goal of this video is also to teach you how to come up with ways to implement all those ideas that you have for your game by yourself. It's a short video for beginners, so I'm going to be omitting a lot of detail, but don't worry because all of that detail is something that you can pick up on as you get better at programming and as you practice. So let's forget this nonsense for now, and let's just start with the basic structure of a game script. That's what this file is that we're coding in. So this public class at the top, that's just the name of our script, and it has to be the same name as your actual .cs file. And you create that by here in your project folder. If you're using Unity, right-click Create C Sharp Script and name it whatever you want. I already have it, so I'm not going to be doing that. This colon mono behavior means that we have access to functions that come from mono behavior, which Unity will run behind the scenes. And the first of these mono behavior functions is the start function. And if you're using Godot, it is underscore ready, and it also wouldn't be mono behavior in Godot, but something else. But whichever game engine you use, it's going to run start or underscore ready or whatever it is once at the beginning of the game for every single script that has a start function. The update function, or in Godot, the underscore process function, is called every single frame, which makes sense because a game isn't something that just runs once and disappears. It runs over and over again, constantly rendering different stuff or constantly moving enemies around until you close the game. So all of the logic of the game takes place inside every single update function of every single script that we write. The update function will execute our game's instructions one step at a time. Time, every single frame. So for example, an enemy might check to see if he sees the player. If it does, it'll start to follow the player and do that over and over again every frame. See the player? Yes move towards. See the player? Yes, move towards. But how do we actually write these instructions and how do we know what we need to write? Well, it all starts with the concept of variables. Variables are the building blocks of programming. They have a type and a name and the name needs to be spelled the exact same way every time you reference it. The type can be an int for an integer or whole number, it can also be a float for a decimal number, or it can be a string which is just text, or it can be a boolean which is only able to be either true or false. But it can also be a more complex type which we call an object, which is where that new new object from earlier comes into play. Objects are interesting because they are actually just made up of simpler variables. For example, you might have something called player data. And here what's going on is we have the type, which is player data, and the name, which is also player data. And everything needs a every variable needs a type and a name. In this case, we're just conveniently also calling it player data with a lowercase. For example, we could say that the player data object has health or it has a level or XP or something like that. And you can see that I'm accessing those variables that belong to the player data object using the dot. And this isn't actually a real thing. I'm just using it as an example. So let's just do a float called speed. To give it a value, I'm going to go into the start function because since that happens first, it makes sense that at the beginning of the game, you want to assign a value to it. And we're going to say speed equals three F semicolon. Uh, F is something that you have to add to floats or decimal numbers to tell it that it is a decimal number. And the semicolon is just added to show that it is the end of the statement. Now in the update function, because this is where things will actually happen, we're going to need to see how we can make objects move. And there are a few things that we have to understand in order to be able to do that. Okay, so here we are back in the Unity editor. I'm just going to create a cube and scale it up, create like a floor of sorts, and also create a capsule. So if we select the capsule and look into the inspector over here on the right, you can see all these different components. So in Unity, every game object needs to have a transform, which shows you the position, rotation, and scale. If we move our capsule, you can see that the X or the Z, or if I move it up, the Y coordinates are changing. And you can also attach other components to it that define what sort of behavior it's going to have. Like for example, it's suggesting to add this rigid body. 
which we will do. And the rigid body just means it's going to use physics, it's going to fall when it needs to fall. This is also where our script is going to come into play. We're going to add our custom script to this as a component. Every component is also an object. I don't mean a Unity game object, I mean a C sharp programming object like we just looked at with that player data example, which means that in C sharp, you can access any one of these fields or values that you can see on all of these components. And that's where the get component function comes in. It allows you to access any component that's on the object and change it and manipulate it. So back here in our update function, let's program our capsule to move in a straight line. How do you actually approach this problem? How do you reason through it? Because in a tutorial, they usually just show you, hey, here's the code, here's what it does, but they don't teach you about the step-by-step -step design process of how to actually come up with that solution. So let's start by breaking the problem down. Well, we know we need one of the coordinates on the transform to change. Where do we change it though? Well. As far as I'm concerned, we have two options, either the update function or the start function. If I set the coordinate here in the start function that only runs once, we will only set the value of the coordinate once. We need to be constantly adding to it every frame, which means we have to put it in the update function. But what code do we write here? Well, as I mentioned before, typically you would use the get component function. And by the way, the script knows about get component because of this mono behavior that we're using from. And the way this works is that you type what component you want here here in the angle brackets and you add normal brackets because it's a function and functions do need that specified and then semicolon for the end of the statement and this is the way that you would get any component you could get the material you could get the collider you could get any of those uh, components that are on this object except this isn't how the transform works the transform is special because it applies to all game objects we can just reference the transform whenever we want explicitly like this all right so in the update function let's add from transform.z equals transform.z because we're adding to it plus speed semicolon for end of statement. And what this will do is, as it says, increase the Z coordinate every frame. Only is it right? See, I already have an error here. It says transform does not contain a definition for Z. And what do you mean? I see it has a Z value right here. Here's how you find the answer to things in programming that don't make sense. That's right. I'm literally going to show you how to Google things so that you can research. I'm actually using Brave here. So let's check Unity transform because the transform is what I'm trying to deal with here. Unity scripting API transform. Okay, so we have all these properties here and I don't see X anywhere, but I do have this field here called position. Well, okay, if I go into this, what is this? Transform the position. Oh, it's a vector three. Well, what the heck is a vector three? Well, okay, well, let's look at its properties. Okay, and here now we see an X, Y, and Z component. And those X, Y, Z components must be what we're seeing here in the inspector. And if you look over here, okay, position is the name of the field here. And then this must be the representation of the vector three. So there we go. Just by Googling it or looking it up on Brave, we figured out what a vector three is, or at least we understand it well enough to work with it. We know that it's something that has an X, Y, and Z component. We're not going to go into details about what a vector actually represents mathematically because well, frankly, right now, at this moment, you don't need it. You can gain that knowledge as you learn and as you get comfortable with program. So back in our script, we're going to change this to say transform.position.z equals transform.position.z plus speed. And back in the editor, we still have problems. Why? Cannot modify the return value of transform.position because it is not a variable. Well, it seems like we're doing everything right, and the documentation doesn't really give us any clear indication as to what's wrong with this. So let me look up something else. Unity transform position not working because I don't necessarily know what to look up. And if I just quickly go through these answers, I'm noticing that they're not really doing the same thing that we are. They're not necessarily all that helpful for us. But one thing stands out to me is that this guy is actually changing the entire position variable with this new vector three thing here. And in fact, I can just look up this error code too. cannot modify the return value of transform.position. And this reveals to me basically that, well, it just 
doesn't work. It's not the way that you can do this in C sharp. And again, this is legitimately a situation where you don't need to understand the ins and outs and all of the details of why that's the case. But as you can see, as you look things up and try things out and progress in your programming practice, you will learn these things. You will just come to know them and eventually you'll develop a better understanding for why all of this is the case. So how do we actually overwrite the position without changing the other coordinates and maintaining them? What we saw earlier, there's that new vector three. And basically what you're doing here is you're constructing a new object. So when you're declaring an object, you have to use this new keyword to signify that you're making a new object. And you call the constructor, which is a function of the same name as that object. And a vector three takes in three values, an X float, a Y float, and a Z float. And we happen to have just that. We're gonna make a slightly altered copy of the transform.position vector. So we're going to pass in transform.position.x, transform.position.y, and transform.position.z. Now, of course, because we do want to move the position forward, we're going to change transform.positionz to transform.positionz plus speed, which will constantly increase just the z value. And because it's being called an update, it will be overwriting the position value with a new vector three every frame. Slightly changed with a new z coordinate. So in the editor, I am going to put our new component onto this capsule object. And if I run the game, in the scene view, it already looks like the guy is moving at a ridiculous speed very, very quickly. So we're gonna turn down that speed. But what if we only want things to happen under certain circumstances? For example, if the player is pushing a key. So first of all, let's make this like 0 0.1. And this is where if statements come into play. I think if statements are a lot easier to understand than objects, but remember guys that if you're confused about anything, it is totally fine. Because in programming, you really only start learning once you start doing stuff. You're going to start to put the pieces together. And before we continue, if you want to test your knowledge of game development already, you can join the Utica Meg Game Jam going on right now. It's not too late to join. You can spend a couple hours trying to make something work because game jams are 100% the best way to actually learn game development. So I highly recommend you join. So if checks are very simple, if brackets in here, the condition that you're trying to evaluate will go. Curly brackets is the code that will be skipped if the condition is not true. Or in other words, this only happens if this is true. And what is this? Well, we need to put some sort of condition in there. And because we wanna check for the player pushing some button on the keyboard, we're just going to do a very simple placeholder input dot get key, quotation marks, W. And again, you're gonna be Googling it. How do you check if the player is pushing the W key in Unity? So we're taking a little shortcut here. So if this is true, everything in the curly brackets belonging to that if check will get executed. Let's see this in action. I'm gonna put my game camera over here and I'm gonna press W. It's not working. It was a lowercase W. And we can see that I am now moving in a straight line forever. Now at this point, you're probably thinking, Andre, I've seen this all before. This is just another tutorial like any other. Well, it's not. Here's why. I'm trying to teach you how to think. I'm trying to teach you how to solve programming problems and come up with solutions yourself. I could have Showing you some cool feature like how to make an enemy or combat or something and said here copy what I do but I want to bring this down to the foundations and make sure that you have a strong understanding of them. Design is such a big part of programming that just isn't something that tutorials ever get into because they're designed to teach you specific solutions not general approaches. So what do we do if we want to for example restart the level if the player falls off the square? Well first of all we have that rigid body component that will tell us that we can actually fall. If we run this, we'll see that he does indeed fall. And there he goes. So again, let's logic through it. One thing we can do is look at the transform and look at his Y coordinate and figure out if the Y coordinate is below a certain point, like the floor is negative 97. So we can check if Y is less than negative 97, restart level. But how do we restart the level? Well, it must be something very specific to Unity because it's related to Unity's level system. So again, I need to research this. I'm gonna look up how to restart the level in Unity. 
and we have this application dot loaded level function. Perfect. That's all I need. And by the way, guys, real quick, if you want to learn more about all the different facets of game development, not just programming, then you can get my free indie game starter guide in the description. It'll give you a nice, quick, smooth start into this hobby and give you a strong foundation to really get into game development. All right. So now if the player's coordinate, which we know we can check by transform.position.y is less than negative 97 f then we'll drop in that function we just saw and maybe this won't work i'll leave that up to you to figure out let's try another example of this whole logicking through a process let's say we want to create a turret that will shoot the player how can we logic through it and represent it in programming terms so this cube will represent the turret and it will turn towards the player and shoot him and he will shoot these little spheres that we will create so algorithmically speaking, what's actually going to be happening? What's the step-by-step -step process? Well, step one, the turret tracks the player. Step two, every few seconds, shoot something. Let's say that sphere over there. Maybe every three seconds. And step three, if that something hits the player, restart the level because we killed him. Now for the turret itself, I could spend time figuring out how am I going to rotate the transform to figure out how many degrees to rotate by to track the player. Well, instead of doing that, let's see if we can find an answer online. Unity track to target, let's say. Well, this isn't giving me much. How about unity object rotate towards another? was rotate towards, but I happen to know that there's also this function called look at, and it takes in a transform. So I'll create a new script for the turret, but what about making it spawn ammo? Well, back to the internet. Unity spawn object. Okay, object.instantiate. That looks interesting. Oh, but there's so many different kinds. Well, guess what? We're going to pull the first one and just trial and error this thing. Okay, so if I was to keep on trying things and researching things, eventually I would come to these two functions. Because look at needs some other transform, it needs to know what you're trying to actually look at. I need to create a player variable. You can see it's a type game object and some ammo to instantiate. Now this works. It's going to happen every frame, basically. Every frame we're going to create a new piece of ammo that just sits there. So we can do the same thing for new ammo that we did with the player, except this time we're changing the local position equals new vector three. And again, me telling you it's the local position is just a shortcut. You'd have to figure this out because if you tried to change the position, you would see that no matter where the turret turns, it would keep going in the same direction. But how would you do this if you wanted to spawn something every few seconds instead? Well, our unity update function is running constantly, so it might run maybe a thousand times in three seconds. We just don't know. So if we can come up with a way to keep track of how many seconds have passed, we could do just that and do another if check. If seconds pass, this doesn't exist, but if we imagine if we had it, then we could call instantiate only after those seconds have passed. And then maybe we would reset seconds passed. And maybe somewhere else it would be going up by the amount of real milliseconds or seconds or whatever that have actually passed. And if you were to research this, you would come across time.time .time and time.delta time. The whole point is to just drill in this idea into you. Step one, research the problem. Step two, break it down into programming terms. And step three, trial and error as you implement it. For example, should we even be using these position variables? Is there something else we should do? Is there maybe a way that we can add force to something? Well, I'll leave that in your capable hands. Now, in the meantime, what if you wanted to expand this out into making full on games? So far, we've only looked at the absolute basics of programming and even programming is only a small fraction of game development. Like I said, with this overview, you'll have a much better understanding if you do go into tutorials. And of course, if you choose to try to implement things yourself, but it's also going to be very easy to get overwhelmed by game development regardless. And so to make sure that that doesn't happen and to make sure that you start making games that you're proud of efficiently and quickly, you need to watch Watch this video because in it I go over a roadmap of all the major milestones you need to hit across your game dev journey to make the process as smooth and fun as possible. Thanks for watching and God bless and let me know if you want a more detailed and slower breakdown of programming or if this was helpful.